Welcome to Scary Gadgets 8. All right, Ben, I saw you for a second. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, thank you, man. Okay, let me get this. All right. So first, let me show off what I got. Uh, what we got here is a device that will, uh, basically, it's a car horn trap, uh, kind of like uh, in Lagoon's Tear Ride at the end. So uh, down here on the floor, I have this. <laughs> got that I plugged that in. I have this laser gate. <laughs> um, and it's uh, basically pretty self-explanatory. Someone walks through it, it trips uh, uh, the, uh, it sends a signal down here, it's my circuit, and honks this motorcycle horn. So, and uh, yes, it works. So the circuit overall, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, basically, power coming in through here uh, to power my rails. Uh, Trying to get an angle here. Uh, sensors coming in here. And what do you need? Just show. This is a better pointing device or than out or something. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I blame you. Okay. Sorry about that. So anyway, uh, I'm actually gonna go ahead and plug it. So yeah, uh, Arduino over here uh, runs our runs the code, and all it's basically saying is when it gets a signal from here, uh, it will just power this MOSFET here, uh, which sends a signal to the horn and honks it. But that's 12 volts. How are you getting the signal to the uh, Arduino without frying it? So this whole system is on 12 volts. Um, and like even the rails are on 12 volts, but uh, over here we actually have this voltage regulator so that we don't blow the Arduino. And over here we have a different kind of voltage regulator for the data. Voltage divider, not a regulator. Voltage divider. It does the same basic thing. It makes it makes sure that we don't blow up the Arduino. <laughs> Uh, so that's basically it for the circuit. Why don't you show uh, us the MOSFET, uh, how those get wired in on end channels you have on your whiteboard there? Okay. So the MOS MOSFETs are actually pretty cool. Uh, I'll come up here. So in order to get uh, enough voltage to the horn here, we need to... Um, like get enough power. So uh, we send it through the MOSFET. And what the MOSFET does is, if I come up here, it, our power will come in through source. Yeah, source. Uh, this is where uh, the power from the Arduino comes from. Uh, and then right here, we have it connected just to the power rail in the circuit board. <clears throat> and then it connects to the buzzer and then back to ground. Except for it's 12 volts instead of six. Yeah. The thing I copied to make this diagram said six volts. But yes, ours is 12. It's also worth noting that you're switching ground rather than switching the power so the power lead is directly connected to the buzzer, but it's ground that we're switching on and off. Yeah. It's also worth noting that that has everything to do with the fact that this is an N-channel switch. Yes, this is an N-channel. Uh, MOSFET, yeah. A, a P-type switch would be wired differently. So that's all I got in terms of physical electronics. Uh, I also have the code up over here. So let me just stop video here. 
And then I'll turn on video over here. Let's see. Uh, there's a screen share. Okay, this one. Uh, we want this one. All right. So, uh, right here is my code. It's pretty, pretty simple. All we're doing is we're defining uh, our horn and sensor pins, our honk time and how, how long the horn's honking for. Uh, in this case, we're just doing it for a full second. And then a delay time, which will be important in a minute. So we set up our sensor and horn pin. We make sure that our horn pin set low so we don't immediately honk it when we plug it in. And then basically when uh, sensor pin reads low, because the uh, laser gate is actually weird in that uh, when it gets tripped, it'll actually go low. So when the laser gate's tripped to go low, we're going to honk the horn, and then we're going to wait for that uh, honk time. We're gonna honk for a full second, and then uh, change it back to low. And then uh, this bit of code here. What this basically says is wait 10 seconds, then double check that the uh, sensor is clear before rearming. What the what I'm hoping this will accomplish is uh, now kids can't just like run back and forth across the porch honking it 30 times, like, and it like gives it'll take them a little longer to figure out how this thing works so that they can't just like play with it as much. It's more surprising that way. So yeah, that's all I got. Cool, very good. Question. Hey, yes. Ben, how are you, when you go into production, are you gonna keep it on your bench power supply or are you gonna change the power supply? Um. I'm a little undecided. I might use the power supply or I might pull out a car battery. Nice. I'm thinking that next year, one of the things that we're going to do, just because A, we're always, <laughs> it's hard to come up with ideas sometimes, but also because it's terribly useful, is uh, various ways of powering these things. Uh, some of these need to be waterproof to go outside. Some of these are high voltage, some of these uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the applications have different requirements than your tip, your typical wall ward a lot of the time. So that might be something we cover next year. Yeah, that'd be cool. Any other questions? Okay. So <clears throat> what I've got here is I've got a bunch of images that look like pumpkin faces. And I'm going to use a projector to project these onto pumpkins. <clears throat> You've probably seen them before, where like they're singing a little tune or something. But I'm trying to do something a little bit different. And what that is, is I'm going to try and make this live customizable so I can to say something like, hey, Batman, give me some of your candy and I won't, you know, spit at you, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I can, I can customize it towards the kids that are actually coming up and I think that'll be kind of cool. <clears throat> so the way that would work is I've got a just regular Windows Forms application here. Let me move this out of the way, there we go. And I've got two forms that come up. One is a control form, and one is kind of a main form. This is where animation happens. And I'm using Azure's Speech SDK, and it's pretty neat. I'll give you a, a little preview. And then we'll dig into the code a little bit. Okay, everyone see that? <clears throat> so I can enter some text, like this is a test, and I can pick from one of 
several voices. So let's do, you know, Eric. And then I say go. This is a test. And nice. Yeah. <clears throat> what you saw there was uh, Azure generated a wave file for me. It sent it down, but also sent down this metadata. And this metadata is very interesting. Uh, it maps what is called a uh, phonem to a vizim. So let me grab this tab over here and show you. So it comes back with, for vizim number six, for example, uh, it's the mouth you would say for eat. So you know how you make a, a little bit of a slightly open tongue forward kind of eat, like maybe this one. Um, and then what I did is I just kind of drew for all 20 of these vizims a different shaped pumpkin mouth. Now, this is the part that probably is the, the least good. I'm not good at drawing. I'm going to later have my daughter redraw these nice. <laughs> but it, it does work. And another thing that's kind of cool is I can do voice to text to Vizim to animation. So here we go. This is a bit of a test then. This is a bit of a test then. Oh, live demos. <laughs> Out of range exception, huh? Ah, oh, must not have all the mouth positions. Let's see. Zero to 21. Should all be in there. Wonder what idea I got back. Anyway. Yeah, live demos, what do you do? Well, that's what you get for only testing with cuss words, man. <laughs> no, actually that was the phrase I've been testing with, but I did make a pretty big change right before I got on. So <laughs> that's probably why. Um, but yeah, let's go back to that uh, test for a second. Do Jacob this time. Hello, Spider Man. I love your costume. Well, let's see if I can salvage this. Live debugging, that's what we'll do. Okay. <clears throat> Play requested. Next. Um, While he's doing that, I'm going to be doing a live install, so mine's not going to be much better. <laughs> I fully expect some hardship. But uh, this year, I decided I'm going to I'm going to try it a little bit differently. Instead of building the project and having that screw up in a live demo, I built the project, left it, and I'm going to build the software on the fly instead. I thought maybe that's a little less risky, but we'll have to see. Uh, I I don't have a lot of faith. It's just an experiment. Cool. A few moments later. All right. Well, let's try it one more time. We'll try a test. Maybe I'm not going to get a number that I didn't expect or something. <laughs> I swear I had this working two minutes ago. Yeah, then you changed it. Yeah. Testing. OK, good. That one works. OK, but uh, yeah, as you can see, like Vizim of zero is just kind of the normal natural look before you even start speaking. And then um, it's saying right after that, we, we should go to 19. We come over here, 19 is. this sound for like no or snow. So we expect 19 to be kind of a more rounded mouth. And if we go check out 19, hopefully, I was smart enough to make it like a rounded mouth. Oh, come back. Yeah, so this is slide 19. So yeah, I, I think if these were drawn better, the the effect would play out a little nicer, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, you can even see where some of this comes. Like uh, there's two T's in testing and it's a very similar face shape between them. In fact, it's uh, the same. <laughs> but just, I don't know how well the, this might be going a little fast for Zoom as well. So I don't know how well it looks on the screen, but it uh, looks pretty good here. Testing. I see a tad delay, but it still looks pretty good. The kids wouldn't be saying, hey, that doesn't look right because of the delay. Yeah. All right. So to the code, um, most of this stuff is happening in the control form. Um, so I pull in as dependencies via dependency injection, a service provider that I don't think I'm using, <laughs> uh, an I animator of type image, which I'll get to in a second, and I configuration. I need the I configuration because I need my speech SDK key and configuration region. You have to go to Azure and <clears throat> create this in your Azure account. There is a, a free tier that is basically more than oodles for something like this. So the free tier is, is, is plenty, but um, you do need it to set it up. And when you set it up, it'll give you a, a speech SDK key. Uh, I'm doing this activated, which I'll go through in a minute. And then the last thing I'm doing here is I'm loading in all those mouth position images. Neat little pro trick. The enumerable dot range is really handy for taking something that would normally be a for loop or something uh, and allowing you to use the nice uh, fluent style syntax or functional looking syntax. Um, so this is going to load, you know, M00 through all the way through M21 because there's going to be 22 of them in total. Um, when we get activated, that basically means when the form's ready to pop up. Uh, at that point in time, I'm going to get the list of available voices for my region. <clears throat> if I would have put this in a British data center, then I could pass in that I want UK voices and it would give me back UK accents and all that, all those kinds of things. Even works in different languages. So, you know, if, if I wanted to pumpkin speak in Spanish and still wanted these to all work, it can do that. Okay. So next little bit. Thanks, babe. Is, You're welcome. Um, this go button click. <clears throat> so the go button click is going to take um, whatever's selected as the voice selection. It's going to set that. Then it's creating. Maybe, maybe a, we make that a little bigger. Oh, yeah. Good idea. Thanks, Phil. How's that? Sweet. Okay. Uh, then I have a list of a tuple of the, the zemes that I expect to come back. Unfortunately, I don't get them like all back all at once. I get them back as it's synthesizing. And that's actually good um, <clears throat> because if I were doing the record my voice and do this thing, I would only want to, to delay a little bit before it starts doing the animations rather than having to do like the entire thing I want to say, then having it come back with the entire thing I want to say, and then animating that and thing, which in this case, I am doing it that way. <laughs> but if I was doing something more complex, like I wanted to do a character interaction with a game or something, and I wanted to use this to, to properly animate their voice and stuff, then I would probably uh, make sure that whatever I'm doing is, is just kind of going live and I'd use this event a little more live than I am. But as it is, I'm just using it to collect my offsets. Um, one thing that I found was a little weird it talks about one, it's coming back as ticks and one tick equals 100 nanoseconds. So I have to divide by 10,000 to get the number of milliseconds. But I also found that there was kind of a unexpected shift in the time values that it was giving me uh, such that I had to subtract back off half a millisecond, not half, yeah, half a millisecond. No, half a second, there we go. Which is a, a ton of time I had to subtract back off. I don't know why that is, but this value seems to get it in pretty good in sync. I don't know, like I said, how this is coming out on Zoom, but uh, <clears throat> in terms of, you know, if you're here live watching it, it looks pretty convincing. So anyway, uh, I 
ask the speak the synthesizer to speak the bit of text I did. When it's when it's done, I uh, grab the audio data for later. Uh, I, I'm just using this to set update status, and I'm calling this generate program. I'm sending in that those that list of vizims that I've been collecting. I'm sending in that audio data uh, that I pulled out. Actually, this line does nothing, doesn't it? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and um, I'm using an offset here. So the reason I have a second offset is, um, I was using that, what am I thinking? Oh, well, the reason I have a, an offset ability here is, um, right now I, I speak it and it puts the text in and then it goes and gets the computer voice for that text and then speaks it. But I what I really want to be able to do is say, say my text, and then I want to record that audio file, and I want to uh, play that on the, on the screen, my actual voice, so I can do a little bit of voice acting. Um, so in order to do that, though, uh, when it recognizes the vizims from my voice, there's an audio offset that is extra because it takes a second to start listen, recognizing voice. Um, so that, that time between I push the button and when I start talking, I have to erase that out. Fortunately, Azure Speech SDK tells me exactly how many milliseconds in the audio clip I start actually speaking. So it's pretty nice. But um, since this one is, I'm just saying, typing stuff in and going, there's no need for any additional offset, if that makes sense. Uh, the generate program is dead simple uh, function. It's dead simple. It's just <clears throat> it's just selecting the keyframes into an animation keyframe type, which is a type I've defined, and we're making sure it's ordered by correctly by time index. We tell the animator to reset. That's going to clear out any old program states. We tell it to load a program. And we tell it to set an audio. This is actually meant to be used where I can do multiple different programs all at the same time. And the reason for that is right now I'm only animating the mouth, but I want to be able to animate the eyes or any other features on here at the same time. So I did I did put in support for the interface. It's not implemented that way, but I, I have a few days till Halloween. Uh, and then I set audio, and then from there, where are we? Here we go. I, I ask it to play the animation. And uh, I omit this part as a little bit, I need to refactor it quite a lot, but I'll go through how it's working now. Um, animator, play animation. Uh, it checks to see if we have an audio clip. If it does, we're playing it. I was writing it to disk for debug reasons. <laughs> and that's calling this on player requested invoke. And that's really where this all starts happening is uh, actually on the main form. So we go, go to the main form and we have on player requested, which is this function. So this is the function that gets called um, by the control form when, um, well, by the animator through the control form telling it to start the animation. <clears throat> and what it's gonna do is it's going to, I'm just using stopwatch just to make sure things synced up, but it's going to go through all the play frames, all those key frames and get each one. Um, this is a nice example of using that async, I async enumerable pattern that uh, Dan showed us a few months ago. But this is pretty great because what we can do is in this get, oops, get play frames. Um, I'm actually delaying the amount of time that needs to be delayed before yield returning the frame that they're supposed to be on. Um, but the only way to do an, an await inside of an enumerable is using the I async enumerable type. So that's kind of neat. Um, if 
but yeah, I mean, this is just kind of the iterator. If you've never used the yield return, it's very handy for anything enumerable. Um, basically, I don't know if you noticed, but on my main form here, I never had to to list this or anything. This whole thing uh, is deferred executed until I actually enumerate it. And it's not until uh, animator, it's not until here that I'm actually enumerating those uh, that ordered collection. So, um, but back to the control or main form here. Uh, the only thing I'm getting currently out of here is the image, but I've got a, a bunch of other data in here I could use. So, like I said before, I wanted to animate eyes and things, but you're going to need different offsets for that so you can blend it correctly. Um, so, result uh, is actually not result. Let's see. The uh, animation keyframe actually has not just the frame data, but the start time index, the location of where it should draw, and the size of what it should draw. So all that information is in each keyframe that it's going to, to do. And so in this case, I do uh, I assign the current image to my image box, which is basically all I have here is this is just an image box. Uh, inside of a main form docked. And then uh, this is something that uh, I'm probably doing just out of habit. <laughs> it probably doesn't need this because we are using a weight. So I bet if I, I bet if I got rid of that, it'd run just fine. We'll validate that. Test. Yeah, so it worked, looked pretty good. So I'm just going to trim some of this out to make it look better. <laughs> there we go. All right. And I guess that's pretty much it. Are there any questions about any of this and how I did it or how it works? I, I did kind of yada yada through the uh, last thing, and that's um, there's a listen button click. So this would do wait on the listen microphone async. I'm just getting a recognizer. I'm just doing a recognize once rather than recognize continuous, like it's stating here. And when it's done, I basically put the text into the text box and I click the go button automatically. So that's why I can go, uh, let's see, generate codes. So I can do test. Test. And it does it. So test, test. Test, test. All right. That is my demo. Are there any questions? I had a question about the Azure service. Yeah. I think this is a really awesome project. If I want to do this at my house, uh, is that a free service? Are there limits to it? What's it going to cost? Any idea? Yeah, there's free. Uh, I mean, you're trying to remember this off the top of my head, but for up to uh, five or 50,000 words per month is free. So that's pretty good. That free tier is going to last me for all the need to do this prop. Um, cool. Yeah. So it'll work for me for Halloween. Yeah. I, I suppose if I let my kids play with it nonstop from now till Halloween, I might run out of uh, Azure credit for that, but. Cool. Thanks. Yep. All right. Uh, so that's mine. Are you ready to go, Phil? Well, we'll see. So um, I have two projects to do. Let me share. Uh, I did not get to add the theme to this slideshow. So Sorry, it's black and white. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what NeoPixels are, they are the Adafruit brand of lights based on the WS2812 LED controller. So these are individually addressable LEDs. So you can buy an LED strip on eBay um, and 
there'll usually be just RGB. So the whole string can be any color, but just one color at a time. The NeoPixels can be any color and any brightness on any of the lights on the whole string. And the strings can be chained or cut. So uh, NeoPixel is what you'd get from Adafruit and they'll be more expensive to be the name brand. So you can get on eBay and just buy WS2812 LED, RGB LEDs and you can use those for this. So I've listed the hardware that I'm using and on this list here is the LED script that I've just mentioned. And I'm going to use an ESP8266 controller and the controller is gonna be on the ESP01 board. These are pretty inexpensive, they're teeny tiny. And I've got my phone here. Um, I'll just whip some of this out. So you're going to look at the user named Phil if you wanna see this. Watch me make a mess over here on my phone. I don't know if you can actually see that. Let me tilt it. So I got a box with four of these from Amazon. You can get them cheaper on eBay, but I needed them before this meeting in order to show them off in this meeting. Phil, so, all we see is your get started hardware slide. I've, I've spotlighted it uh, for everyone, so we see your camera now. Okay. Now, if I share my screen on the laptop, these are the controllers. They're about the size of a postage stamp. They have an eight pin header on the back. And I'm going to plug them into two other devices to get this job done. The first is a programmer. And it re there really is nothing to it except that it's a USB to serial adapter. And of course you always need one of those to work with any microcontroller. But this one is just a little bit special because it has this switch on it, which puts it in programming mode. I don't know if you can, I don't think there's enough light, but it's just a little slider switch here. And what that does is it pulls pin zero to ground. And on the bottom next to the pins, it has a label that tells me which, which direction is which. So it has a female header here. I'll pop the module into the programmer. I'll set the switch to program and then I'm going to dump my code onto that microcontroller. So back to my slides, I've listed the microcontroller first and then the programmer. The third thing that I've listed is this RGB LED adapter. And once the chip is programmed, I'm going to use this to connect the LEDs to it. These are five volt systems. The NeoPixel LEDs are also five volts. So make sure that you get a five volt power source for them. But uh, the RGB adapter, has a power regulator on it. So I can put, I well, I could probably put quite a bit of voltage into it, but it's gonna get hot if I put much more than five. So it runs off USB just fine. I've put a 4.5 volt battery pack on mine and it works great. So in the slideshow, in case anybody uses these in the future, I've just put some details about which programmers, which hardware to buy. So here's the, the screenshot of the programmer. And there's another kind out there that doesn't have the slide switch on it. Same thing with the microcontroller. There's some confusion because there are lots of ESP8266 microcontrollers available. This is the ESP01 module, or you might see ESP1. Uh, and uh, it's not the Node MCU. There's a picture of the LED adapter. I've only seen the one kind. Now, uh, I, I mentioned before, I'm going to get risky here. And I'm going to actually do this from scratch. This machine has never worked on this project before. So I'm going to install it before your very eyes. So I'm going to, I can't really zoom this in, I don't think, but I'm going to go to, um, go to my slideshow here and download this library. And this is the library for this WS2812 uh, uh, controller. And it allows us to control these using our phone or a computer by hitting a website on the microcontroller. And that's really cool. I'm going to copy this to my clipboard with control C, and then I'm going to, I'm going to see where my Arduino is installed.
Okay, so here in my Arduino folder where the IDE lives, there's a libraries folder and I'm going to just paste the, not the zip, but the folder inside the zip into this location. I'll leave that open just in case I've forgotten something. And then back on my slides, I'm going to install the, uh, the library that was just installed. I'm going to open it in the include library manage libraries dialog. I'm going to wait all day. Then I'm going to click on the search and type WS2812FX. And there we go. This is Harm Aldix. That's the one we want. I'll pick the latest version and click install. And that's done. Now I'm going to add the NeoPixel library. And the one we're looking for is just Adafruit NeoPixel by Adafruit. And I'm gonna pick the latest one. Okay, now I'm going to close and I'm just gonna restart that IDE for good measure. And well, I'm doing this in a bit of a strange order, but it, it should be fine. Uh, this opens up with, oh, I shouldn't have that one up. I'm going to open the examples and it's picky. There we go. I should be able to find, if I scroll down here, the WS2812FX uh, submenu. And I'm going to arrow through to the ESP8266 underscore web interface example. Now I'm going to <clears throat> ask you all to look away while I put in my Network credentials. Okay. And this is commented out, so it's going to use a dynamic IP address. And it's going to ask me how many. LEDs are on my LED strip. And I'm going to put in that there are 60, I think. Boy, I hope it was 60. And if I needed to change the pin, I would change it here, but two is the one that I want. And so I'm going to save this. And I can put it any old where I'm just going to say, Once that's done saving, we can verify and compile. And I don't have any doubts that this will build. So watch it fail. Uh, actually, I did expect that. So I get this error, and this is why I did this out of order. In case you run into this, I wanted to show it. The ESP8266 Wi-Fi.h, no such file or directory, is the error that I'm getting. And what that means is it doesn't know about my board. If I go to board, I had it set to Arduino Nano. So I can come down here and set it to the right board, but I don't have the right board. So we need to go into our preferences and add the board. So down here, we have additional boards managers, boards manager URLs. I'm just gonna click in there and take the URL that I have in my slide here, paste it in there and click okay. And now in my boards list, oh, it's still not there. Did I miss a step? Hmm. 
No, that should do it. Tools, boards, boards, manager, search. This is the step I'm missing, apologize. ESP 8266, that's what I was thinking, 8266 community, not Adafruit community. Make sure I'm picking the latest, latest version and install it. A few moments later. Goodness gracious, it's like working on the early Android emulators. Okay, now tools board. And that installed all kinds of crap. I want generic ESP8266 module. And now when I do a verify compile, I believe that should work. For those that don't know, you can eventually drag this split. There's a splitter in here you can drag up so you can see more of the output. There we go. There's the splitter I'm talking about. I can drag that up. And it's irritating that there's so much red involved in here when there aren't errors. It just decides to use color for, for fun, I guess. So it says here, done compiling, and I didn't get any errors. So what I'm going to do now is take that USB device and I'm going to have to unplug my mouse and maybe my keyboard, but we'll see. I'll pop that into my USB port gently. And without a mouse, I'm gonna have to clumsy my way up here to sketch upload, which I see is control U and I'll do that next time. That's gonna do the compile again, hopefully faster this time, but probably not. And I have an error. Oh, well, I didn't set the COM port. So out here in tools, you can set the board and you also need to set the port and it was set to COM5 of which there is none instead of COM, probably COM4, but I don't know that for sure. So I set the port and I try it again. Looking good. And it might be just me, but it takes a long time to write to these little ESPL ones. I don't know if that's because they're slower, if the program uh, programmer uh, is slower, or if it's because this thing has so much space that it's writing, because these things have quite a bit of flash RAM. There's a megabyte in there. So it's done, and that should be it. I'll take that out. And I will the ESP module out of the programmer. Now, I have, I have an LED strip somewhere. Oh, here's my battery. And I have a, breadboard and the only reason I'm using that really is because I permanently keep these little terminal blocks screwed onto the ends of my battery packs so that the wires don't touch each other in my when they're in storage it just keeps them separate and then the batteries can be left in the battery box and then I pop them into a, a breadboard and it makes it easy to use these little uh, uh, 
these jumper wires. I got these off of a, a DuPont wire. It's a ribbon cable with male prongs on one end. You can't see that at all, can you? Male prongs on one end and female prongs on the other. And I just tear off as many as I need. So I'm going to use white for positive and black for negative. And as soon as I plugged that in, I've powered my uh, microcontroller. I don't want to really do that because I'm not done setting everything up yet. So I'm just going to pop a battery out of here for good, for safety. And these little RGB leads are, uh, they're on a, a removable plug that I've just, it comes with it, but I've got it, I left it plugged in. I'm going to take the microcontroller and plug that in onto the socket. And do dismiss me for just a moment. I got to run and find that LED strip. I thought it was in this box. This is one meter long. It has 60 LEDs. This is not the weatherproof version, but the whole thing is encased in silicon, in silicon rubber. So it, it's pretty resistant, I would think. I haven't tested that yet. Maybe next year. Okay. Okay. Um, you have to plug these into the right end and the right, oh. Um, I believe the right end is the male end. So I'm gonna take out a couple of my wires here. Okay, I'm going to use green for ground, not really, but kind of. And I'm gonna need some jumpers. Okay, because this is a male end, I just need a couple of guys to get, get a grip on. Green, black, and red. So I do know this is getting tedious, but I did rather hope to kind of show you the actual build. Wrong one, here we go. This one. So I'm just gonna stick these in according to the same color, mostly. So red to red, I can't see it all. Black to black. No, black to white and green to green. Green is the signal, that's the middle one. Let me see if you can see this. But here on the LED strip, you've got the wires going in and they're, they're all parallel going up into this shrink wrapped shroud. And then as it comes out of the shroud, the ribbon is printed and you can see uh, ground. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Uh, plus by the bolts, ground, and uh, it looks like DO, but it's the digital signal, uh, the RGB signal. So um, now that I have those three guys, and now they're male, I'll put my clips on them. Now my signal is yellow, and my ground is green. And on the other end of these guys, be very careful with these. They're fragile and they're expensive, but they're amazing. If you don't have one of these types of miniature clips, you are doing it wrong. I'll fasten these to the ends of the LED adapter. Red to red. Of 
green is ground and yellow to yellow. Okay, so I didn't do anything fancy here. All I did was take three leads from one device to another to another. And when I put back the battery, it should power the MCU and the MCU is already programmed. So it should just immediately start powering the lights, which it doesn't do. Well, maybe it does. Um, I don't know what sequence is in here or what speed it's set to. So what we wanna do now is assume the IP address that it connected as. That's not it. We're also making the assumption that this thing actually made it onto the Wi-Fi. What's the uncomment for static IP? Well, if I want to program it again, I can use that, but I would also be making the assumption that that works. I might just do it. So I'll unpower this. I think you're missing Let, some symbols at the end of the gateway. I'll, I'll double check it here in a second. I haven't tried it this way, so we'll have to see. I was going to tell you about that, but uh, you look busy. I was busy. That's fine. Unfortunately, this is the easy project. Okay. Slam this back in. Looks about the same, I think. Yeah. Now, try that browser again. Hot diggity. So, on my screen is the web page hosted by that microcontroller. And I'll just maximize that. And you can see that there's a color index on the left. There's a brightness, speed, and auto cycle settings over here. And we have presets of all types on named buttons. So if I set this to chase rainbow, I just click this. Oh, good, it's working. So you can see the LEDs have changed their behavior. And if I set it to strobe, you can expect what that's going to do. And that's a very slow strobe. Instead, I can change the speed by clicking the plus, 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 plus. And now it's a very fast strobe. So I don't know how well Zoom is handling it, but over here, it looks like you would expect it to. It looks like one of those toy strobes you'd buy in the Halloween store. So a lot of these pre pre uh, presets are pretty fun. Um, there is a Halloween one somewhere behind my participants list. Maybe not, I don't see it. There we go down here. But you can see that that's kind of purple. I don't think that's quite right. So I'm gonna go over here to the color picker and I'm gonna click on the color, color that I think should be orange. And it's not very good about picking the color. In fact, right now it doesn't seem to be doing anything, but uh, I'm not too worried about that. 
it might just be a little slow on my Wi-Fi or something, but you know, the behaviors will change. Uh, you can come in here and you can fiddle with it and make it do whatever you like. And you'll note too, that there are some custom buttons and I have not taken the time to figure out how to use those. But I thought uh, Dan showed this to me. This is all Dan's, but Dan can't be here with us. And he said, look at this thing. You just slam it into an ESP8266. It hosts a website and it controls Arduinos with NeoPixels. And you don't have to do any programming. And I thought, well, we better show that then. So there was no, I don't know if you noticed, but there's no actual programming in here. All I did was modify the sketch to put in my network credentials, which I now have to change. And um, the, the number of lights on the LEDs and the output pin, which I didn't even have to change. And I have myself some kind of holiday lighting. And I don't know if, if any of you have the problem that I have, but I can't build these giant props that I want to build that you, we try to build every year because I don't have the space to store them. So my whole holiday display is lights. So this is a really cool way to get into it. And if I wanted to, I could probably modify this application to do something fancy cool if it doesn't do just what I want. And again, I can take one of these strips and you've got wires on both ends. I can daisy chain these any way that I want to do any number of uh, LEDs within reason. I don't know what the limits would be, but the controller have, has to actually have enough RAM to, to drive a certain number of LEDs. And we had trouble finding the specs on these to determine how many they could drive. So you know, if you want to get crazy, you'll have to do that research or trial and error or something. But that's it. That's the, the first project. So are there any questions? Cool. I'm going to close and close. Let's go through the rest of these slides just to make sure I covered everything. Uh, there's a how. Oh, I didn't mention because it seems to work. On my other machine, and I can't believe this, but there are still Windows installations that do not have a CH3 port or driver installed or available. I don't know why that is, but um, on this laptop, I probably installed it manually years ago. So the, the in the programmer, in this guy right here, it's a serial to uh, USB adapter, but it's this chip right here at the top is a CH340 chip. And that is a replacement for the famous FTDI chips. So if you have an FTDI chip, Windows will probably install a driver for you. If you get a cheaper Chinese one off eBay, it's gonna have this CH340 and you have to install a driver for it manually, probably. Um, so I, I made sure that that driver link is in the in these slides somewhere. And here, yeah, there's some instructions in there with it. Um, we covered the assembly, which you saw me do. Make sure it's powered off when you do that. And we operated it and there were no questions. Here are the links for everything that I bought. They're not the best links, they're the links that I used uh, because I have to buy from Amazon for uh, the Halloween meetings because we never have enough time to get them from China. So you pay extra to get them from Amazon. They're cheaper on eBay. But uh, those are four and five packs for some of these. That's why, and, and that's, that's probably what you wanna do. You may not need four MCUs, but you'll probably want them because one of them's going to go bad. You'll blow up another and the third one's going to work and then you'll have a spare, right? So we're going to build an Octobanger and I'll show you what that is and why it's cool. So this is a $20 prop controller. Um, it's not really, but that's what they used to call it. And so if you want to find it online, that's probably a good thing to search for. Uh, so what is a prop controller? If you've been on YouTube and looked at uh, how to build Halloween props, animated props, and uh, animatronic props. You'll find that people are using these. And you can buy them at any Halloween props do-it-yourself store. Uh, some of those are Monster Guts or uh, Fright Props, I think. Um, a lot of the popular ones are made by Fright Ideas. They seem to make all the really popular ones. And they make a bunch of them. So you can get one that does that has just the features you want, but they're all very expensive. In fact, Take a look at that second one down there. The Monster Guts website sells this PC4, which has four relays and is equivalent to the button banger and costs $149. And it really does have just the same stuff. The only difference is it's all in one board, but I'm, I'm happy to have a couple of different modules that are all just nailed down in some fashion for 20 bucks. So what these things do is, as it says in the text, you can actuate DC devices in a sequence according to a soundtrack in response to triggers. So our prop controller is the button banger, which evolved into the octo banger. So the button banger has 
four, between one and four relays, typically four. It has an MP3 output and it has a trigger. So it, can, it consists of the software that the guy wrote and a list of electronics that you can just buy anywhere. It's the, the button banger itself is the guy's software. And it lets, it lets you build one of these prop controllers with an Arduino without doing any actual programming on the Arduino. So it's pretty cool. And here's a slide that just says the Octo Banger is a button banger, but with up to eight relay support. The rest is pretty much the same. It's, it's just the newer version of button banger. The website is still button banger. Otherwise I wouldn't mention it. I just wanted to explain why you're gonna see both of those and what the difference is. So that's cool. Is it really 20 bucks? No. Uh, I did the math and thought, crud, this has really gone up and tried to figure out why. And the major reason is just that all the parts have gone up in price on eBay. So I actually wanted to show this last year, but I couldn't get the dumb thing working. And I never did figure out why, but I thought I'd give it another try this year. And there are three reasons that it, three, three things that were different and any one of them could be the cause. I used different hardware. I got a newer version of the software and uh, I had a misunderstanding about part of the way that it worked when I was trying this the first time. So I was looking at using different hardware and I think I paid half as much for the hardware last year as I did this year. So the pandemic's really driven stuff up, but it's still, it's still pretty close. Uh, you might, you're, you should be able to get into it under 30. So uh, the documentation for how to do this, how it works and, and everything is available at buttonbanger.com. And if anybody wants it, they can't find it or something, I have it. Um, I just copied it onto this. In fact, I don't even have it on this machine. I put it in Slack so that I could get it to this machine. So here's what you'll need. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything, but of course you'll need an Arduino and a relay board. Uh, the relay board provides all of the outputs. And if you, the two combinations that you probably want to consider are an Arduino Nano with an eight relay board or an Arduino Uno with a four relay shield. So last year I tried it with the, the Nano with the eight relay board and was having trouble. This year I'm using the Uno with a four relay shield and that worked nearly splendidly. As far as the software goes, it worked perfectly. So the MP3 player is not a name brand Cadillac, but it's a YX5300 that I'm using. And you wouldn't know the difference. And it's not the cheapest MP3 player out there. It, the, T, the DF player is the cheapest one that I can find that works that I like. But this one, I could hardly get working, but it works fine with this project. The guy's done the coding and it works fine. In fact, it's, it's built for it. So now that I have one, uh, now I have a use for it. Ha. But apparently there's an, a new one and you don't want it. He thinks he's kind of hacked around to make it work with the new one, but he wrote it for version one and it works best with version one. Um, the DF player allegedly works with this and that would be nice. And I have some and I would have liked to try it, but I didn't have the time. But if you have DF players instead of a Cadillac's YX5300, you can probably give those a try. Uh, you'll need amplified PC speakers. The Cadillac's doesn't have an amp in it, or at least not a, a very good one. It's a teeny tiny thing. I wouldn't push my luck. So get yourself a pair of amplified speakers or, or amplified system of some kind. Uh, you'll need a power supply, of course, and whatever you're plugging into the thing to power. So that brings us to problem number one. And the relay shields don't fit. This was a problem that the, the button banger guy put on his website in the instructions. Uh, he had to modify the board to fit on, a, on an Arduino Uno, even though it's built for an Arduino Uno. How dumb is that? So um, I've got some slides in here for that because I got the same board on the same problem and I had to fix it too. And it doesn't take much, but I didn't want to screw up my shield because I knew I needed to be able to present this. So I've taken some screenshots uh, some photographs of this at the time that I was dealing with it, asked the blokes in the office, hey, what do you guys think about this? And I got some different ideas. So there are quite a few different ways you could do this, but um, it's on this side. Anyway, uh, this is the finished dealio and I doubt you can see this. Uh, that's why I included the pictures on the next slides here. Um, there is a picture of the problem. You see that the top board is stabbing the bottom board and those pins are touching the USB plug on the bottom board. So we have to grind off those pins on the top board, not quite all the way, but just down to a bump. So we want it as flat as we can without messing up the circuits. And this is what it looked like when I was done, but you can see that now that those three pins are flat against the housing of the USB port, there's gonna be conductivity. So I needed to insulate them. And what I ended up doing was putting in, I cut up the, 
the, the anti-static bag for the shield that, it, that the board came in. And I just laid it underneath there and I attached it, covered it up with blue painter's tape just to hold it on there. And I trimmed it with a knife once it was on there to make sure that it was as clean as I could make it. And it hasn't given me a lick of trouble. So that's what I would recommend. Other suggestions were silicone or uh, insulative trans uh, thermal transfer sheets that you put on your heat sink, between your heat sink and your TO220 packages, that kind of thing. Whatever you got that's insulative would work, but this was handy because it came with it. And I've just slapped a joke in here, which I told, told you before I didn't want to spoil. So why do programmers always mix up Halloween and Christmas? Because Oct 31 equals DEC 25. For those who don't get it, Oct means octal and DEC means decimal. A little math humor there for you. So I've typed out the instructions uh, one at a time and I'm not going to fool with the hardware. I'm going to fool with the software instead. So I'm gonna go over to my Slack real quick. Okay, what I have here is, uh, are the downloads from the website mostly. The octobanger.zip contains the exe, I think. There's the exe. Um, why does that not have, uh, it's a shortcut. Okay, so here's the exe. And if I run it, I get a splash screen here that allows me to make a donation. I fully intend to do that because I think it's pretty great stuff. And the guy put some work into it, but you don't have to, you can just click continue. So here's the guy. So first thing we want to do is plug in our Arduino with the USB cable. And hopefully that gave me a COM port because this is an Uno, it has the USB controller built in. And I should be able to go to upload firmware to Arduino. And I'm not going to do that because this Arduino is already flashed. But that's going to take a hex file, which you'll find in hex. And it's going to dump it to the firmware. This hex file is a pre-compiled Arduino sketch whose source code is probably available, but I don't care to look at it. It just works. And that, soft, that firmware is going to look in the EEPROM for sequence data and play that sequence data out on the relay board. So now that we've got the Arduino flashed, we're going to create a sequence. So I'll go and create a new controller and I'll give it just a few parameters. I can tell it that I want um, to do a scare track only, which, is, which means that it plays sound when it's triggered or I can do an ambient video, or sorry, an ambient and scare, which means it's playing mute, spooky music all the time. And then it switches to a second track when it gets triggered. So it'll do the ambient track and the scare track, or I can do video. And I haven't tinkered with video because, uh, uh, because it's just a little much for our meeting, but I would like to. What that lets you do is you can go and buy these little video players that will play MP4 files off an SD card that you stick in the side of them. They have a composite out and an HDMI out. You power them, and then um, this program will let you plug your USB plug in your your computer into the USB port, and it will trigger the sorry your Arduino into the USB port, and it will trigger uh, a video clip in the video player. So instead of just playing sound, it'll play a video as well. So for this one, I used ambient and scare, and you can specify the. Uh, mp3 files here. Uh, down here, you can tell it which channels you want to use. There are uh, between one and eight. So I can, uh, you can have all of them. There really isn't a turning off any of the channels. It just plays them all. It just won't play channels five through eight because I only have four relays. It just, the relay shield doesn't do it, but the signals will be there. It just doesn't care. One thing you can do though, is you can change the active low to on. And what that means is that it'll be the, the trick, the the output will be off when, uh, sorry, will be high normally. And then when it's triggered, it'll go low. So it just inverts that for devices that function that way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this because really what it does is it produces this project. That's how this one was created. So a couple of things to know are you, you've got a tree view over here and you've got tabs over here, right? So we're on the first tab. 
And down here you have the sequence editor. So in the tree view, we start with the top node and we can change the, the values in here. So I can change comments and the display name and the pin mapping. The pin mapping is gonna be between the Arduino Uno with a shield or an Arduino Nano with uh, one of those eight relay boards. So because I'm using an Arduino Uno with a shield, I'm gonna set it to shield. The timed off, the timing offset type, there, there's really just two. There's there's on default, which is 405 milliseconds. He's tinkered and said that's the right setting for some some configurations, or there's none, which is no delay at all. Uh, the trigger ambient level is high and low. And the difference is if you want to use a step pad, then you want it to be high. And if you want it, if you're going to use an uh, a PIR sensor or a motion sensor, then you want it to be the other. So we're going to leave it as high so that when I hit my step pad, it connects the it connects the ground and the ambient is high. So uh, connecting the pin to ground will will trigger on my shield. So timing uh, the end sequence delay seconds, I think this defaulted to 15. I set it to six because what will happen is it won't let once it's triggered and it plays the sequence, it'll play out the rest of this sequence delay to 15 seconds before it can trigger again. Now that may be practical in the field when this thing is out scaring the candy bandits, but when I'm trying to put this thing together, I was wasting no end of time waiting for this thing to constantly time out and reset. So I set it down to six minutes because down here I have this, you can see the waveform for the MP, for the, uh, the scare track MP3. This is a, a chainsaw sound and the, the, sequence only goes this far. So I can come in here and use the right mouse button and change how long I want the sequence to be. And because this thing ended here, I just clicked somewhere north, just a little north of that. And uh, I saw that that was about five seconds. So I set it to six and figured that's good enough. So enough about that. The channels we've already configured when we created this. So you don't have to do much with that. Media, uh, you can go and change this and uh, I've, never I've never fiddled with the volume. I put these on powered speakers so I can just adjust the volume with a knob. Um, and then uh, the readme, I don't even think that works. I, I don't know what that's supposed to do, <laughs> but there's, there's probably a readme in here somewhere. Anyway, uh, all the documentation that you have is a little redundant. It probably doesn't tell you anything that's not in those PDF files. So now that we have this, kind of ready to go, uh, we could come down to serial communication and try to connect to uh, the Arduino. I don't know what that's supposed to be doing. It says COM3 and then it has some Chinese letters. I'm not anxious to see if that works, but I should be able to click this USB plug and the port doesn't exist. I'm going to unplug that and plug it back in and hopefully get a new port. And I'm going to just close this and see what I've got in here. I might have a power problem. I certainly have uh, a keyboard problem. Okay, I've got an Uno on COM5, so there shouldn't be a problem with this. I will try it again. Okay, now all of my stuff is still here. It remembers that. And I'm going to come up to the serial communication. Now I have a COM5. Don't know why it's throwing a fit, but now it's fine. So I'll click connect. And I should see some stuff here, good. It's going to point out a couple of things for my settings. I could double check them here and make sure that they're good. I wanna see that the trigger pin is A0 and that the, uh, I wanna see that it, yeah, they're, the pin type is shield. So uh, I can come down here and click this RSS looking icon and the tool tip says send played states to controller in real time. And so I'm just gonna click that and it kind of turns it on. And now when 
Uh, I can't see this phone, so I'm just pointing it in general. Can you guys see it? Yep. Okay. I'm going to click the play button and it's going to go through these colored sequences in each of the channels and it's going to, I think it'll play the sound. You can see the LEDs clicking. Sorry, you can you can see the hear the relays clicking maybe and you can see the LEDs flashing in the sequence that is on the screen. So the sequence is in working order and the Arduino is connected and it has the firmware installed and it's playing back the sequence. So now what we want to do is dump that sequence into the EEPROM so that it will read it and play it back from there. I can do that with this button right here that says transmit config to controller, but it doesn't just send the config, it also sends the sequence. If you've already done that once, you probably should be able to do this one, send sequence only, unless you change the config. I haven't had much luck with that. It does work, but it it's a little finicky. Um, I just click this one every time and I don't worry about it. And so once I've done that, it should put the uh, the sequence into the firm, sorry, into the EEPROM, and I can un can unplug this from my computer, plug it into a power source, and it'll just go. So in order to trigger it, I have, uh, let me put this back into the light so you can see. On pin whatever it is for the trigger, uh, zero, one, or two, I've, I've just put a jumper on it, and then I've put another one on a ground pin. So when I just touch these together, it should trigger it. So before I get any further, I'm going to, grab my speakers. And plug them into the MP3 module. I already have my SD card in there. I want to make sure that it didn't pop out because it's one of those annoying, really nice spring loaded uh, sockets, the kind that always makes the card pop out when you pick it up. They're nice and I hate them. Sad world. So Oh, I missed a step. Um, in the uh, in the dialog up here in uh, in media in the tree view, um, I don't I don't know why that didn't come up. Maybe it maybe it did. So once you've selected, you can select your MP3s up in here, and once those are set. You can click on this SD button and it's going to copy those files to your SD card for you. One of the hardships about dealing with these little MP3 players is you have to make sure that the files are the right file name in the right folder on the card with the right format. This takes care of that for you. And so it was it saved me no end of frustration that I would have with any of these other projects. So I've already gone and done that and put the uh, I just use the sounds that came with the default project here, but you can use your own. And so now I'm going to power this thing. I'll just unstick that. This is a 12 volt power supply and it's seven volts more than this Arduino needs. But the Arduino Uno has a power regulator on it that will bring the voltage down to five volts. The problem is that it's it gets so hot you can fry an egg on it. It really shouldn't be that much voltage, but I won't run it for long. So as soon as I plug this in, it should start working. And I think my speakers, I'm gonna double check the volume on the speaker so I don't hurt anybody. Okay. In. So I heard a beep beep in there. So it's playing my ambient track. Now, if I touch these two together, it should trigger it. And when that happens, you should see the LEDs go crazy and it should play the chainsaw. Easy peasy. Now it's going to wait that six seconds, starting from when the trigger happened. And I won't be able to trigger it again until that expires. 
So this should do it. All right. So uh, that's a relief. I'll unplug this now. So my demo's worked, Nate. <laughs> oh, well. Um, I did not, and I, I, I had a hard time today because today is not Thursday, it's Wednesday. And I thought we were doing this on Thursday. So I was not entirely prepared. I was going to hook up this LED strip to these relays and, and you could see those being turned on and off with the controller. But I'm going to skip that just because we're running about the time here. But let's take a minute and look at this editor. And I'll just take one more moment to show you um, how the editor works. So if I wanted to change, actually customize this, first thing I'd probably do is give myself a little more time. And then I'd come over and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but down here, there's this button. And if I hover over it, it says toggle edit select mode. So I'm going to click it. And then now I see a pencil and I'm in edit mode. So this red ball will let me scrub, not scrub, it'll scroll the timeline here. And so now I have all the way out to wherever I put this red line. And if I use the left button and drag it, I get an on switch in the sequence anywhere that I drag it. So that's very easy to do. And if I screw it up, I use the right button and it's an eraser. Could not be easier. So if I wanted to just cut those all in half, and then plug in my Arduino, send the sequence to it, power it up, I would then see the new sequence. So uh, let's say I wanted the sequence to go all the way out to here. And then I set my new end there. Don't forget to click the floppy disk. And it's as easy as that. So the reason you can see the waveform is so that you can synchronize your switching according to the soundtrack, to the scare track, if that makes sense. Okay, questions? None at all? All right.